Today I want to talk a little bit about standard thermodynamic conditions and how we calculate enthalpy. So we're going to do a couple problems to figure out how do we get to these h and delta h values, where do we find them, how can we use them, why are they important, and all of that happens under standard thermodynamic conditions. So we first have to define kind of where are we doing these things, under what conditions, and these standard conditions are at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. So that's the standard state in a thermodynamic context. If we're thinking in terms of our SI units, that would be 298 Kelvin. And you can tell that a reaction or a process is being measured under those standard conditions because of this degree symbol here. So the degree symbol, kind of as a superscript, indicates that this reaction is occurring at 25 degrees Celsius, which is just a hair above normal kind of room temperature, and one atmosphere pressure, which is the pressure on Earth at around sea level. So that's the standard state. Now, um, another important term that we're going to run into in talking about these, kind of how we calculate enthalpy, is the reference form. And the reference form is the stablest form, or the most stable form of an element that is at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. So for example, the stablest form of oxygen under those conditions is O2 gas. So it exists as a diatomic molecule, and it's in the gas phase. Um, we could also talk about carbon. So carbon, under standard condition, is a solid. That solid is graphite, right? Um, carbon has different what are called allotropes. And those allotropes are different forms of the same phase. So carbon can be either graphite or it can be diamond. Under standard thermodynamic conditions, carbon is a solid and that solid is graphite. So it's good to indicate that. That's the allotrope that is the reference form of carbon. And it looks like a five there in my little parentheses, but we know that it's an S for solid. Now, if those reference forms can be used then to calculate what is called the enthalpy of formation. So that delta H of, with a sub F here, F for formation. And if we have our degree symbol here, that indicates that it's the standard enthalpy of formation. So it's how much heat or energy it takes to form one mole of a substance in its standard state from its elements in their reference form. Okay, so this delta H value is really important and we find tables of these enthalpy of formations um, in what are called the you know thermodynamic tables, standard thermodynamic tables, which we can find in textbooks, for example, they look something like this where you have values in kilojoules per mole, and then you can kind of see the different forms. You can see the different um, ions. You can see the different compounds that are commonly formed with them. And so these thermodynamic tables are used, and the numbers that I am going to be pulling from when I do examples today are going to come from these thermodynamic tables, which are set at, again, 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere of pressure. So. We can use kind of this, this information, this change in enthalpy, to calculate the formation um, of all sorts of things. We could calculate the formation of a compound, for example. And the way we would do that is if we know the balanced chemical process with the elements that are put together in the reference forms to form that compound, then the way I can calculate my delta H is by taking the sum of all of the molar quantities of the change in the heat of formation or enthalpy of formation for my products, so for the right side of my arrow, and then I will subtract from that the sum of all of my molar amounts of my delta H of formation for my reactants, so products minus reactants for a chemical process. So this sum then, this kind of N and M here indicate molar quantities, which are going to relate to the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. So what I'm going to do for this particular reaction to solve for delta H is I need kind of one times my molar amount, because there's only one of these guys of my product for my carbon tetrachloride here. And when I go to the standard thermodynamic tables, I find that 
the value in kilojoules per mole for my carbon tetrachloride is 135.4 kilojoules per mole. And that's the only product I have. So it's one times that amount. I'm going to subtract from it the sum of my reactants. Now the reactants in this case are going to be fairly straightforward because they are in their reference forms. The delta H of anything in its reference form is going to be zero. So I have zero for my carbon, zero kilojoules per mole. That's the way it exists, so I don't have to put any energy in or get any energy out making that happen. And then I'm going to add, because we're summing them together, two times my heat of formation for my chlorine, which is also zero, because that's also the elemental form of my chlorine. So again, even if I didn't know that, even if I wasn't sure about the reference forms and kind of what that means on an energy kind of level, um, I'd still look it up in the table. And the table tells me that carbon in its solid form as graphite is a heat of formation or energy of formation or enthalpy of formation of zero kilojoules per mole. I'm going to add those together and I end up with just this negative 135.4 kilojoules per mole. Now you probably aren't bowled over by the math there wasn't super high level rocket science or anything. But what it does tell you is that negative sign indicates that the heat is coming out of the system from the formation of the carbon tetrachloride. So when heat is being released, that is indicated with a negative sign. So we would say this process is exothermic, meaning that the heat is released from the system into the surroundings when I form carbon tetrachloride, and that usually means that this is a lower energy product than it is my reactants, so that's a good thing. And I can tell that it's lower energy because my energies of my starting ones were zero, and then this is less than zero. So I'm going to a lower energy form, that energy has to go somewhere, that energy is going to be released. Okay, another application of this is in looking at phase changes. So let's take water for example. There's a couple different ways we can do this, and there's some new kind of subscripts here that tell us what the different enthalpies are relating to. So my delta H VAP here is the heat of vaporization. So vaporization, of course, is going from a liquid to a gas. So it's the amount of energy that it takes that you have to put in to go from a liquid to a gas. And the delta heat of fusion, or the delta enthalpy of fusion at standard conditions, the heat of fusion is going from a solid to a liquid. Because you'll recall that fusion is another term for melting. So this is how much energy you have to put in to go from a solid to a liquid phase. Now the opposite of that, so if I had a negative value of this, if I kind of put a negative sign in, that would be going in the opposite direction. It's kind of the relationship between these two. So here's my delta H VAP. I'm going to go from liquid water to gaseous water. And if I wanted to calculate how much energy I had to put into this process in order to do that, then I'd have to go to my chart and I'd find that my delta H for my liquid, my heat of formation for my liquid form is negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole and my gas is negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. Okay, now I'm going to do the same operation, so my change in delta H, in this case we're doing the vaporization, at standard conditions is going to be the sum of all of these things of my products, and then I'm going to subtract from it my reactants, We're looking at delta H VAP in this case. Delta H VAP. Okay. So now I just take my values. Here's my product. Minus my reactants. And when I analyze this, when I'm before I'm plugging it in, I can see I have a minus a minus sign, and I'm starting at a negative quantity, 
but my quantity here is larger, so I'm expecting my answer here to be positive, and that makes sense in this context. So when I do the math here, I end up with 44.0 kilojoules per mole. Sig fig wise, I'm looking at a tenths place because I'm adding or subtracting, so we're looking at the lowest number of decimal places. So what this is saying, because this is a positive value, is that this is an endothermic process, meaning I have to put energy into the system in order to do it. And that makes sense because I know that I have to heat up water in order to get it to evaporate. So this is the amount of energy I have to put in in order to get one mole of this to go into one mole of gas particles. So this is kind of another useful way to do that. And again, these, these values come from the table. Now another useful way we can do this is we can calculate the energy of other types of chemical processes. So for example, when I dissolve things, like in this case I have a strong acid in HBr. This is hydrogen bromide because it's in its gaseous form. But if I dissolve that in water, then it becomes its acidic form, right? It's going to dissociate. It's a strong acid, so it dissociates completely into its hydrogen and bromide ions. This process is going to have some certain energy that's associated with it. It'll either be endothermic or exothermic, and we can calculate what that heat of reaction is going to be for this particular process. So when I go and I look at my values here, then I find that HBr is negative 36.44 kilojoules per mole. Water in its liquid phase, we just looked up for the last example, is 285.8 kilojoules per mole. Hydrogen in its aqueous form is a reference form of hydrogen. So this hydrogen ion in solution is a reference form and therefore is a zero. I have liquid water on both sides. It's kind of the medium in which this is occurring. So I'm going to put this here, but we'll talk about it in a second. And then my bromide ion is negative 121.5 kilojoules per mole that I produce. All right, now I'm going to do the same operation, and I will add together all of my values on the product side and subtract from it all of my values on my reactant side. I have to take into account the balanced chemical equation and multiply by my coefficients, but in this case, because everything is 1 to 1 to 1 to 1, then I don't have to worry about it. Now the other nice thing about this is because I have water on both sides, if I'm taking this value and subtracting this value, these guys are essentially going to divide out. So we could kind of think about water here as a reaction condition. It's something in which this reaction is occurring, but it's not going to have any sort of energetic impact on it because the impact of my values is just going to zero itself out. So if we're looking for the delta H of this overall process at standard conditions, I'm going to sum together my products. and subtract from it the sum of my reactants, which in this case I only have my HBr left over. Now we can see that we have a fairly large negative number here. We're going to be adding to it, subtracting a negative, a smaller number here, which means that my overall reaction is still going to be a negative value. And so when I sum these together, I end up with negative 85.1 kilojoules per mole. And that negative sign again means that heat is being evolved from the system out into the surroundings, and this process is exothermic. Okay, so dissolving that gas in my water and it dissociating into its component pieces is going to be an exothermic reaction which causes energy to be released from the system into surroundings, and that's indicated there with my negative value. Remember that energy itself is never going to be negative. That sign just tells you what's happening with this particular process. As always, if you have any questions on this, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I will talk to you again soon.